Hi, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about static type, static type checking, but first of all, um, a bit about myself. Uh, I'm Dave, I'm on Twitter, but I don't really talk much about tech on there, so if you're interested in like beer, cycling in Cambridge, then you might want to look at that. <laughs> um, I've been a full-time Pythonista for about six years, and I have no connection with my Pi, I'm not a sort of developer or anything, I've just used it a bit, and I thought I'd share what my experience was of using it. Uh, so in this talk, I'm trying not to assume that people know about static typing or my Pi, um, but the introduction will be fairly quick. So if you don't know already about it, then hopefully that will give you enough to follow stuff. You might have to sort of gloss over a couple of details. Um, but I'll give an introduction to static typing and to MyPy. Uh, I'll give a bit of context of the situation where we've been using it. Um, I'll talk about some of the challenges that we experienced when we used it, some of the things we found difficult, and the benefits that we got from using it. Um, and then I'll kind of give a conclusion as to whether we thought that the, the benefits were worth the challenges. Um, spoiler, yes, we think pretty much did. <laughs> so, static typing. Um, it's a thing that like, most people are at least a bit familiar with, but to sort of state the definition, you assign type labels to expressions in your source code, or to, um, to, to, to items in the source code. You have rules for how those types can be combined. So you say, if I've said that this is an int, uh, this is a function that takes an int as an argument, I can only pass the int to the function, I can't pass something that I've said to the string to the, to the function. You then check the type correctness of statements before runtime. And it's the before runtime that's important here. Um, you don't only hit these errors when you try to run your code, so if you... Um, and why would we add this? We, we, we've kind of created a new way of raising errors against ourselves. Um, most of us don't like having errors raised against us. The general idea is that the, the way you set up your type system, the rules of correctness that you have, are such that a lot of the time there's quite a strong overlap between things that um, will cause a type error, things that aren't correct according to your rules, and things that will be a bug in your software. So for instance, if I've said this function always takes, uh, one thing that quite a lot of people seem, happens quite a lot to me at least, is saying I will iterate, I'll take, have a function that takes a list of strings, and I'll iterate through those strings and do something to each string. I then pass it a string. Um, I try to iterate through, this, through the list, list of strings, but because it's a string, I can iterate, it, iterate through it still, but I get each letter individually. And then whatever I try to do to, to the, each string, I actually just get for each letter of my string. Um, in a statically typed environment, I'd have said, this thing takes a list of strings. And when I try to pass it a string, my type checker, before I even <coughs> run the code, will say, oh, you can't do that. <coughs> That's a bug. Uh, so I can go through, find that, and remove it. A fringe benefit of it, uh, of static typing, is it also makes code discovery easier. Um, where normally you have to, if you're lucky, someone's put in a doc string that this thing takes an argument, whatever, which is a whatever. Um, um, with static typing, it's more or less by definition ex explicitly telling you what everything that your function's using is. So that means that when you come to a, um, to try to do something with, with a function to modify it, if you didn't write it, the person who wrote it left the company and they didn't bother to write a doc string. You don't have to guess at what's a legal thing to do on it. Um, a further benefit of it, in some contexts, is that it allows, or reason for it, is to allow compilation to native machine code, but that's not what the MyPy project is about. It's not why we're using it here. So, MyPy is a static type check of Python. Uh, what is it? It's an optional static type check of Python. Um, it's a command line tool. Uh, you can install it via pip. Um, there's also a typing module in recent versions of Python, uh, which is in the standard library, and um, which contains various stuff that you need to add the annotations to the code. So to use it, you add annotations to your code to tell it what the types of things are. You run the MyPy tool to check the consistency of, of those types according to the type system that MyPy provides. Um, and the nice thing about it is that the annotations are then completely ignored by the interpreter. So whatever you've put in there, provided it's, you've used the right syntax for the um, interpretations, for, sorry, for the annotations, um, the inter your code will still run, even if it's sort of throwing your errors absolutely everywhere. Uh, so an example of annotation, this is an unannotated function, it orders coffee, something dear to my heart. Um, it takes an argument A, 
It sticks that A into a coffee order and returns the message. To annotate it, all we have to do is tell it what we expect the argument to be and what we expect the return value to be. Um, in this case, we tell it that the argument A is going to be an int um, and that the return value is going to be a string. It's reasonably clever at spotting um, impl implicit inferring what things are going to be further down in the code. So it, I don't need to tell it that the message is a string because I've defined it to be a string and it can tell. If I make an error, for instance, I forget to return a value, um, which is an annoyingly common Python mistake. Um, or if I pass the wrong sort of wrong type, wrong, if I misunderstand what the API is, and assume that I'm supposed to give it the fact I want coffee, not how many coffees I want, this code is still perfectly reasonable Python and will still run, but I won't get any coffee if I run it. Um, if I run the MyPy tool over that, um, it throws errors. So it says, um, first of all, it says I've got an incompatible return type. It was expecting string and got none. And then it says that when I've made my call, it's got an incompatible argument type. It was expecting str and it got int. Sorry, it was expecting int and it got str. Um, so I can go back and fix my code and make sure I do get coffee. So that's basically my pie. Um, it's optional. And the optionalness kind of comes in about four ways. Um, firstly, it only checks functions if you annotate them. So if you don't put a return value on a function, it treats everything in that code as being not typed, doesn't bother checking it. The return value, it assumes, could be anything. So if, you don't, if you've got a function that you just can't think how to type annotate, you can ignore it. Uh, there's an any type that will work for anything. You can suppress any errors that you find with type ignore. And you can run the code anyway. And this is all quite nice because Python being dynamic is nice and useful and good in a lot of situations. But um, this means that we can get the benefits of static typing in cases where we want it, situations where we want it. But at the same time, we can kind of suppress that and say, actually, let's, let's use the dynamic stuff here and only worry about it in the areas where we want to. Cool, so the context. So I work for a firm called Transversal. Uh, we're a mid-sized firm based in Cambridge. Uh, we make, according to our marketing department, uh, next generation cognitive solutions for customer success. Um, <laughs> roughly speaking, don't tell my marketing department I told you this, what that means is we make quite a sort of uh, uh, customer support oriented content management system with a nice search function, uh, and a bit of nice front end stuff, and a few sort of flashy analytics y things. Uh, we're also recruiting C devs. Um, so, although the marketing department now hate me, the HR department is probably quite happy. Um, the search component of this is largely what I'm responsible for. Um, it's a semantic search engine uh, written in pure Python. It's rewritten from a C++ version and is now faster. Um, but that's a different talk. Um, <laughs> it's a few tens of thousands of lines, including all the plumbing code that makes it integrate with the rest of the product. So that includes stuff for kind of receiving requests over the network and or, um, interpreting JSON requests they get uh, for database access, all that sort of stuff. Um, what's interesting about it is that a lot of it doesn't get changed very often, but when it does, it's quite important. So you'll come to a bit of code that you haven't looked at for months or that someone else wrote, uh, and you want to be able to make changes to it with some confidence and with minimal time to understand what's going on, often in something that's already quite complicated. So that made it seem like a good, um, good candidate to apply static typing to, so we did. Uh, we cut the branch and started applying static typing on it. Um, challenges that we hit. So some code is just inherently dynamic. Uh, if you use eval, if you load stuff using pickle, uh, dynamic use of name tuple, if you stick a name tuple in a function rather than just doing it at a, a module level. Um, if you load stuff from JSON on a smaller scale then you are getting things that you can't automatically annotate as having a type, or that won't, won't have a type inferred and that you can't necessarily say what the type is. Um, how do we solve these? Uh, one answer is don't use it. Um, 
actually half the time, th there are only really two, two cases in this reasonably large code base. I should say that all this applies to our code base and what we found, so you know, your code base may differ. But we only really found two cases where we were using heavily dynamic code. One was basically a de developer trying to save typing um, by using a function which calls name tuple dynamically and returns the thing. But the actual calls to this were all made at module level, so you can just pull out the name tuple um, and just use it, so use it at module level and statically type it. Um, if you get nothing else from this, actually, if, even if you don't use MyPy, um, the need to be able to do this has led to the introduction of a new class-like definition for name tuple in recent versions of Python, which is quite nice if you like that syntax and if you don't like the function syntax. Um, so all we had to do in this case was just pull out the, um, just, just stop making a function call. Uh, the, the next thing that you can do, which actually solves a lot of, we did find quite a few cases like this, uh, which you can do is use is instance. So MyPy's type inference is intelligent enough that if you say if is instance something dict, then it will assume that in that branch of code that something is a dict. Um, in this case, we're loading a config object. We expect the config file to have a JSON stored, uh, a dictionary stored in stored as JSON. So when we load it, we check it's a dict. If it is a dict, happy days, we can carry on, extract all the config that we need from it. Um, testing that as well to make sure it's, it's the things that we're expecting it to be. If it's not, we've got bad config. Um, we can't really do anything with this at all. Uh, so we can raise an exception and so, yeah, raise a pro proper error for it. Um, oh, sorry, I was going to say, if neither of these things work, the best thing you can really hope to do is to contain the inherently dynamic stuff. So. Probably if you're, say, using eval, you're having someone pass you a function, the user input function. In a lot of cases, you'll be doing something fairly straightforward with it, like applying it to something and then checking the return value. If you know what you expect the return value to be, you can check that and make sure that the, the dynamicness of it doesn't sort of ripple out further into the code. Uh, the next thing we found difficult was um, circular imports. This happens a couple of times. Um, the basic issue is this should be this is two separate files. Um, it's not showing up properly on the slides for some reason. Um, basically, you have a node that has a bunch of children. Uh, the child nodes are stored in a node set. Uh, the node set contains nodes. Um, in untyped Python, the node set doesn't need to know that it contains nodes. It doesn't need to have, be aware of the existence of a thing called node, so it doesn't have to have the um, node imported. In statically typed, MyPy type Python, it does. Um, so you get a circular import that you need to fix. Um, the fix that we use, you're probably not going to like. <laughs> we wrap the imports in an if false statement. MyPy does not um, avoid checking branches based on, on truthiness. Uh, so it will happily use the import, um, whereas the interpreter does uh, and won't notice the import, so you won't get a circular import when you come to run your code. <laughs> this is not very nice. <laughs> Fortunately, um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, the developers of MyPy, a, a reasonably bright bunch, are aware that this isn't very nice. And there does seem to be discussion at the moment around a, a much better solution to this, which is essentially letting you flag and have, have the import in a comment. Um, so the interpreter will decide that this, this comment is a MyPy inter in import and run it, uh, whereas the interpreter will not read the comment because it's a comment. Uh, that would be quite a lot nicer. But this is what we're stuck with for now. Uh, the other real thing that we found challenging uh, was missing libraries. Um, so, if you have a library which isn't itself typed, as many libraries aren't, um, obviously you can't then, any code that calls that library suddenly has dynamic things being returned, you're not sure what type they are. Uh, it's possible to write a stub for a library. This is a bit like a C++ header file. It doesn't contain much live code, but it says, in this library, there is a function called this that takes this and returns this. 
there's a class called this that has these methods that take these things and return these things. Um, there are lots of very good stubs for libraries, lots of the standard library. Uh, they're in a project called Type Sheds, and they're effectively bundled with MyPy. If there's not a stub, if you're using something that's either an obscure with the standard library or a relatively a, a, a third-party library that ha doesn't yet have a stub, uh, it's a bit harder. You can write your own stubs and store them in your own stubs directory, and that's good. Um, that's probably better than nothing, but it is a reasonable amount of work. Uh, it's also... Um, <coughs> You run the risk that if the problem is not that you've made one typing mistake, but that you've basically failed to understand how the library works. Um, you know, you've mis misunderstood what some parameters, some particular uh, API function is. Then you'll just encode that misunderstanding into your stub, and MyPy will think everything's all right when it's not. Um, so those are the, the things that we found hard or difficult to work with. Um, the ben oh, yeah, um, the ugly. Uh, the original title of this, of this was The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Uh, and this is roughly The Ugly. Um, it's a function which, actually on a terminal, would happily fit into 80 characters. One line definition, init method, takes a bunch of arguments. In MyPy, you're basically adding a lot more information to a function definition. If you're adding more information to something, then you're basically going to need more space for it suddenly your entire code base is full of function definitions that split over multiple lines, where previously, if you'd been fairly careful with your naming and stuff, or sensible with your names, they weren't. This is just an inherent cost. This is, this is always going to happen. Um, so the benefits that we saw. Um, so the listed benefits in MyPy are, or the, 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 the kind of, the, the advertised benefits are bug catching and readability. So yes, we found bugs, basically. Uh, and we also found areas where, although there weren't explicit bugs that we caught, the code was kind of brittle and error prone and did things which could easily be refactored in a way that would leave it to, be, to lead it to be a bug. Or at least which you'd have to pay quite a lot of attention when you were refactoring it to avoid it becoming a bug. So first of all, a couple of good practices. Uh, get it in a CI, CI server and use strict mode. Uh, if you're the kind of person who is really good at running your unit tests every time you check anything in and doing everything manually and, and sort of that kind of stuff, then this might not apply to you, but if any, you or anyone on your team isn't, um, having the tests in the CI server, is having the MyPy run in your CI server is absolutely great. It means that yeah, you, you, you'll never forget to run the thing. And using strict mode essentially means that anything that you're not typing Anything that you're ignoring, you have to explicitly ignore. You can't just leave a function unannotated. Um, that means it's a bit more work to get the thing passing than if you were just allowing it to run. But you don't then end up with arguments as to whether, you know, MyPy is reporting 74.2% coverage. It was 74.3% coverage last time. Should I fail the build for that? You just say, if you have not explicitly ignored any new untyped code that you've introduced, you will get a mistake. An error. So using this, um, the first bugs that we found were basically pen being pedantic about fail cases. So this is some code, this is actual slightly um, tight, well slightly, um, it, this is basically production code slightly edited for readability. Um, it's got a document which is stored in a file system. Um, the, the file system gives its own IDs to things when it stores them. And what this code is basically doing is getting a document by bringing in a document ID and saying, hey, store of file system IDs, what's the file system ID for this document ID? It then goes off to the file system and asks it for the document using the document ID. Uh, once it's annotated, you realize that the file ID lookup can return none if there is no file ID for that document ID. And the file store can return none if there's no document for that document ID. However, if you write the code naively, it's very easy to just assume that this thing will always return what you expect it to return, and you can pass it in, um, and not realize that there's anything wrong. This is a situation that shouldn't really be able to happen, but if it does happen, you probably want to fail explicitly and loudly, um, rather than just sort of breaking somewhere further down the line, where maybe you pass around a document that's none, 
and somewhere later on you get the thing saying none type has no attribute, whatever, and you don't know why. Um, so the fix is simple, you just use is instance again, um, or in this case use is none. So I've only fixed the first two problems, but if the file ID is none, we just raise a corrupted index error saying no file ID, or possibly something a bit more uh, verbose. Um, and if it is, isn't is done, then now MyPy is happy that the thing that's being passed to the load document method is in fact a string as it's expecting. So yeah, the second place we found a lot of issues, not actually bugs but brittle code, uh, is stuff that's temporarily coupled. So code which is relying on a thing being in a particular state at a particular time. If you're sort of using the same thing for slightly different purposes and there's a thing that you do that changes it from one state to another, it's an easy thing to get into on a code, code base that's evolved a lot over time. Um, that means that anyone who works on it needs to be aware that this is happening and spot that there's a change, something's, what needs to happen and whether something can be used in a particular situation. Um, this actually took quite a lot of headaches to, to get it fixed, uh, but I think the code is basically a lot better for it. You have to really prove and explicitly state that this is what you're doing is a reasonable thing to do with the objects that you've got. Uh, the other big benefit we found is discoverability. Um, this is some code um, called the training data parser uh, that takes a um, uh, it takes an argument called training data, and if you want to work out what training data is, you kind of follow through this stuff and realise that it has an items method, so it's probably a dict, what's in it. Well, the values are probably lists by the looks of it. What are the values in the list? Well, they're things that have an as dict method. If you're coming to this, you don't know. You maybe go back and find where it's called, then find the code that called that, or whatever. Or go and swear at the person who didn't put a proper doc string on it. Um, but in the case of type into code, it just says, the argument to this is a dict of lists to training tuples. Um, if you want to know what a training tuple is, it tells you where that came from, you go and look it up. Um, I actually found this, I've been working in this sort of type, static type environment for a while now, uh, and on the, at the sprint on, oh sorry, at the um, code dojo on Thursday night, I was trying to back reverse engineer some of the code that we were given in that. I just spent a few minutes looking at it and thinking, why can I not figure out what the argument is? Oh, it's untyped. So, um, quick conclusions. So, there are some issues with MyPy. It's not fully mature yet. The library coverage isn't perfect. And because of the maturity thing, it's a, it's a, it's a project that's in very rapid development. Um, so you want to be using recent Python and MyPy versions. And also, I think the big thing is it's a non-trivial amount of work. Not just going through um, adding annotations to your code, but also any new developer you get on a project now needs to know about MyPy. They need to know how static typing works. They need to know all the sort of tools it provides for dealing with different common situations. Some of which are reasonably, you know, they're not just straightforward, as straightforward as the examples I've given. Um, the benefits, it works as advertised. Basically, our code base feels more robust and, very importantly, a lot easier to understand and explore. Should you use it? Well, it depends on the code base and the team. Um, we found it very good, uh, and my basic advice would be it's, it's well worth considering even if you don't want to do it right now. Cool. Thanks for listening. Two questions before lunch. Does anyone have a question? Yes. Do you want to just shout I'll try shouting. Yeah. Um, I've tried experimenting with this and I got frustrated in having to import almost every module that I need. need um, every, pro every module in my project because the types, I might have a factory that calls into another module that uses something else. And now I suddenly need imports from three or four modules away, and they're all going to be there in the user's case. So you did that um, circular import problem, but I found I was just importing every module and every other module, and it was looking like an unholy mess. Um, um, it, did you escape from that? 
So about the only advice I can really give in that situation is that you can sort of visually group. At the I mean, hopefully, if they bring in this slightly nicer import syntax, then that will make everything nice. Um, if you really want to avoid doing the imports in when you actually run the code, you can hide it behind the if false. Um, you do need the imports to be there. Um, but yes, you, you can group them, possibly with a comment saying required for typing before them, um, which at least means that when you want to know what the thing is importing, actually importing, rather than merely kind of referring to, you can see that at first glance. But you do just need to import lots of stuff, yes. I think we've got time for one more question. I saw your hand up, go, go up first. Uh, yeah, thank you very uh, for the very nice talk. It was very clear. Um, if I want to write a library and uh, support uh, ver old, slightly older versions of Python that don't support all of the new syntax around type annotations, is there a way that I can uh, distribute my library, for example, by stripping out the type annotations so that I can support those older versions? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I think there is a, a way of adding type annotations in older versions. Um, I don't know if it's easy to sort of, it's, it's a much, it's a comment based syntax, so you're putting all of your type annotations and comments at the end of things. What I'm not sure about, uh, I don't know if anyone knows this, is whether there's a way of actually saying, I've, I've written this thing using nice lovely Python 3.6 syntax with all of my type annotations, and now I want to convert it back to the, um, the older version. And in principle, I guess it should be possible to write it all to do that. What's that? Provide a start. Um, I think the code would still be. Well, only if it's a type annotation you want to give out mm. or not, but you might start. Mm -hmm. The code itself is fine to be. But yeah, I think it might be possible to write a tool that would convert between old and new um, syntax, but I'm not quite sure how hard it would be. It might be a project. That's all the questions we have time for, so please join me again. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Thank you.